Team, so ADP 6-0, that's what we're going to look into a little bit here as we continue looking at some different regulations and things that I think that we all need to know about what is inside of these things, right? Of course, there are thousands of them. So let's go ahead and break this down. This is coming from uh, my old promotion uh, board study guide, which is not uh, that old. If you look down in the description below, I'll try to remember to leave a link over to where you can download this yourself. So ADP 6-0 is, is pretty small. Um, there it is. And so it covers uh, mission command, right? So uh, the whole regulation is not much, it's not much bigger than, than this entire study guide. As most ADPs are, they are very broad in, in scope, right? And so they're not very finite, they're not very detailed. And that's what the, our other regulations further those down into, uh, so ADPs to ADRPs, down to FMs, TCs, and, and everything else, right? So the further you get down, the more detailed that it, it'll become. But ADP 6-0 is extremely important because it is what kind of provides the structure for how the Army conducts command, right? In this case, it's called Mission Command. That's the name of the ADP, and you should know that, right? That's, that's a given question. It's an easy question that I'm never going to ask somebody, never, never do. Now, what is the regulation that covers Mission Command? Well, first, Sergeant, the ADP that covers Mission Command is 6-0. Man, if you don't know that, you got no business. Uh, but the reason why you want to know it is that you can use it in the framework for your answers. Right, so for example, what is Mission Command? Uh, first, Sergeant. According to ADP 6-0 Mission Command, Mission Command is the Army's approach to command and control that empowers a subordinate decision-making and decentralized execution appropriate to the situation. Now, what does that mean, right? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to look at some basic questions. We're going to talk about some situational questions. We're going to try to break some of this down so that hopefully it makes a little bit more sense uh, to us. I don't know about you, but I'm just a daggum bottom third crayon here. So, empowers subordinate decision making uh, that decentralizes execution. So, what the Army wants is for subordinate commanders, down to that company level commander, to be able to dadgum make some decisions, right? We don't want the decision making to happen all at battalion brigade and echelons above. If you do that, you become over cumbersome. It de demonstrates a lack of trust and confidence in subordinate leaders, of course. And so we want them to be able to, uh, because they are ultimately uh, accountable for their formations, to be able to make decisions at the appropriate for the appropriate things. There's some things you can't accept risk on, right? But there's a lot of things that a company commander needs to be able to make decisions on. And so this is an art and a science of, of command, right? It's an art and a science. So what are the principles uh, that enable mission command? Competence, mutual trust, right? We just talked about that. Uh, shared understanding, commander's intent, mission orders, discipline initiative, and risk acceptance. We kind of we kind of already talked about a couple of these already, right? And they permeate throughout uh, dang near everything as it relates to the military, not just mission command, but on everything as it relates to leadership. Right? You have to have some mutual trust going up and down. I have to know what my boss's intent is, and more than that, I need to know what my boss's boss's intent is. Right? We get this during a QTB or an SATB, and we sit down. We get it during our training meetings at the battalion level or even at the company level. Right? And so I need to understand what direction, where are we trying to get to? And I need to know what is expected of me, and I need to know what kind of risks I may need to, to mitigate in order to be able to get this thing done. And once we have this, this respect and this disciplined initiative, and I understand what the intent is, I have my task and purpose, and I can look out and use my staff to understand and, and prepare core co Koas, learn how to talk, stoke, uh, courses of action, <laughs> and understand what risk needs to be accepted. Then I can be directly positioning myself to enable mission command. Now, that's a good key phrase, by the way, for NCRs and awards is enabling mission command. Ultimately, that's what we all do. We enable this to happen. 
We just don't often give ourselves credit for it. So what is uh, command and control? All right, so we talked about what mission command is. It's the subordinate's ability to be able to make decisions uh, for the appropriate situation. Command and control is the exercise of authority and direction by a designated commander over assigned or attached forces in the accomplishment of a mission. So a lot of times we get in the habit of thinking that mission command is at odds with C2 or command and control. And in principle, they are not. Maybe in maybe in theory and how we try to approach and understand and talk about things in different flavors, uh, they, they can appear to be, but, but they're not. They're synced together. So mission command is that art and that science of commanders being able to exercise authority and to make timely decisions based on the appropriate uh, action. And command and control is their authority over those who are in their charge in order to be able to get those things done, right? A lot of times people will talk about you know, command and control being rigid and structured and telling you what to do, how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And mission command being the, oh, well, I'm just in this big blob and I need to be able to do what I want to do. I mean, yes, but no. Uh, so mission command uh, approach to command and control is based on what? And it's uh, the Army's view that war is inherently chaotic, right? And so because the, it, there is this, this deep level of uncertainty, that's why we have these things called mission command and command and control. Because I need them to be able to operate out on the forward edge of the battle area, aka the FIBA. I need to be able for them to be able to make some daggum decisions, right? What are their elements of control? It's direction, feedback, information, and communication. And that should make sense, right? And so I should be able to frame this and be able to think about this um, and even apply it to any number of questions or, or situations. For example, you know, if somebody was talking to me about, about counseling, although it's not AKA control uh, doctrinally here, you know, you think about direction, feedback, information, and communication. It's just like being able to use the operations process, right? How are we gonna be able to plan, prepare, execute, and assess something? If I can remember those key words, I can frame them in any number of questions. I'm going to plan, prepare, execute, and assess. That is what we do as NCOs in everything. Just like we use direction, feedback, communication, and information to be able to do these things as well. So I can kind of feed them in together in any sort of answer. And when we do that, when we use this, this terminology and this phrasing that the Army gives us, in our answers during a competition board or a promotion board, it helps infuse in those who are sitting on uh, as panel members, as board members, that we kind of get it. We get what the Army is trying to say, even if we don't, honest to God, know the answer. Like if I asked you, how, how are you going to prepare for a range, for example, this is getting off subject a little bit, and you just ran through the uh, eight-step training model and you didn't actually know the answer, well, I'm, I'm going to think that you're on, on your way because you just detailed out how we're going to do this. If you detailed out the eight-step training plan and to, to the T, and even the sub-issues that are in there, and you didn't actually give me any real meat, you just poured over the gravy, like I'm probably going to give you a go for that. Uh, so next question is, what is decisive action? Uh, and that's the combination of offensive and defensive and stability operations that set the conditions for favorable conflict resolution. So decisive action. Um, you know, w we had this thing uh, called COIN, and we still have it, that, that drove a lot. And decisive action is, is the new key phrase. It's the new key thing and hip thing to say or whatever like ultimately again the, the military and the army gets that war is chaotic right there's uncertainty and too many times though we get locked into this belief that it's going to be the same way again and that's kind of what got our our, our butts kicked uh and, and caused a lot of dudes uh to get hurt and to die in the early days, back in 2003 to, to 2006 and 7, and, and then a little, a little uprising after that as well, because we approached conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan the same way that we approached combat 
in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And of course, it was a lot more dynamic than that. And so we had to rapidly change uh, what we were doing and how we were approaching and protecting our troops uh, from IDs and things of this nature. And so decisive action kind of recognizes that, if that makes sense. It recognizes that things are going to be a little bit different. Man, if you've deployed, you know that you know, one deployment to the next is not the same, even if you went back to the same location. All right, rules of engagement can change in the blink of an eye. The people change. Terrain changes if you go from one location to another, even in the same country, right? Southern Iraq is different from northern Iraq, different from east to west. So we need to think about how we're going to uh, employ our offensive strategies, our defensive strategies, and again, that stability operations in order to be able to affect decisive action. And that ultimately, that's what it's all about. So you might be asked some situational questions. Um, it's not a requirement in the board to ask situational questions for Mission Command. Uh, but, you know, I always want to try to keep my folks uh, prepared for the... Because we say situational questions, but nobody ever really talks about what a situational question is or how it could be framed. So again, you know, you're tasked with providing a class on Mission Command. How will you prepare, plan, prepare, and execute that training? And you'll notice even in that, I have that kind of operations process in there. So how are you going to, to plan, prepare, and execute training? That kind of question could be framed with any subject area that you could be asked. How are you going to conduct training? And if you're an NCO, then I expect you to be able to conduct training. And if you're already a sergeant, you should be a T at this because you got taught this uh, at BLC, right? How am I going to give some daggum individual training? So I need, to, I need to go back to the book, right? I need to go back to 6-0 to into Mission Command. I need to pull some uh, key things that I want to draw out of this regulation in order to be able to present it in a way that's going to be understood and be able to be applied by those who are in my charge. I want to sit down with my key leaders, right? Whether it's my platoon sergeant, first sergeant, platoon leader, company commander, and say, you know, what are your ultimate objectives for this course? Is there anything specifically that stands out from your experience and your training and your knowledge from mission command that really needs to be imparted? I want to lean on those who have a little bit more experience than I do. If necessary, I'm going to reserve a location, right? I'm going to make sure it gets put on the training calendar. I'm going to uh, prepare what I'm going to use for the class, whether it's media, whether it's assistant instructors that need to be trained and certified. I want to rehearse my class, preferably in the actual facility where I'm going to be teaching it. That way I can go through everything as it will be laid out during that actual period of instruction. I want to make sure I uh, prepare, again, any handouts or any other media that is going to be used in conjunction with the, with the course. I want to make sure that everybody's assembled and I'm actually going to go through and I'm going to execute that training. And on the back end, of course, I'll make sure I have my sign-in roster that was passed down on the front end. That way all of our training can be documented and, if, if applicable, uh, be documented into DTMS. And, of course, I'm going to conduct an after-action review so I can... Uh, assess my training so I can get better for the next period of instruction. Now you notice in, in that phrasing, although I didn't use all the key verbiage from the A-step training plan, it's, it was all kind of in there. So again, you know, being able to use that phraseology, if I'm going to make up my own words here, to be able to answer your questions like that is, is G to G, man. A soldier asks you about the difference between mission command and command control, man, what, what's your response? And again, I think this is a question that people may not actually ask out on the ground, but there is this perception that there is a struggle or a conflict between mission command and command and control, right? That these two things are button heads, if you will. And so you need to be able to explain what mission command is, and you need to be able to explain what command and control is. If you can do those two things, it's kind of two answers into one question, right? Last one was how do you enable your commander to implement mission command, right? So what do you do as a soldier, as a team chief, as a squad leader to be able to enable mission command for your commander? 
Well, you, you train on your METs, right? You get certified on your METs. You conduct all of your other uh, r related tasks and drills that relates to that. You maintain your readiness, both personnel readiness, medical readiness. All of this feeds into your organization being able to be ready to go out and do their job, which of course is ultimately, regardless of MOS, to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, or to repel the enemy's assault by fire and close combat. If you know what that th that's the definition of, make sure you drop a comment down below. Team, I appreciate all you guys, man. I hope this was a good introduction into 6-0. Make sure you leave some comments down below. That way we can continue to keep this conversation rolling, man. I appreciate all you guys. And until then, you stay out there, you keep grinding, and you stay stoked. Bye.